I have never really done public speaking at all in my life, mainly because in school I would always avoid it. I, I would never do it because I talk too fast, I stutter, I get nervous in front of people, and I just, I, I, I don't know, I just, I can't talk in front of people, you know? <laughs> So when Ted, my boy Ted, reached out to me to do a TED Talk, I was terrified because I thought maybe in like when I'm 30 years old or 40 and I have accomplished so much, that'd be like a dream of mine. And I don't know, that that would never be possible. I would never be doing a TED Talk ever. So when Ted, my boy Ted, reached out to do a TED Talk, I'm like, I am scared and I'm terrified because I just didn't know how to process that. So here we are now. I have glasses. I feel sophisticated now that, now that I've done a, a TED Talk. But because of you guys and the constant support of my videos, I've been able to do this and I, I cannot thank you enough because I've always wanted to advocate for these sort of issues that we have to deal with as amputees and to reach more people and, and just to have a louder voice for that. I can't thank you enough. So seriously, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Um, but here's the TED Talk. Cancer is an interesting thing. I feel like it's something that has impacted almost everyone in this room. And out of curiosity, by a show of hands, how many of you has it impacted? A family member, a loved one, or even a friend? For anyone that didn't raise your hand, I'm extremely jealous because growing up, it was always something that the adults would have to go through, never realizing how easily it could enter my life. Because in the summer of 2016, my knee was hurting. I've been an athlete my whole life for two months. I'm icing it, elevating it, taking some pain meds, avoiding this pain that I'm, it kind of hurts, but I could walk. But then all of a sudden, my first week of junior year, I'm in a wheelchair. Friday, we get an x-ray. Monday, a CAT scan, bone scan, brain scan, MRI, and I'm thinking that my knee is really messed up. Never thinking that it could be something much worse. Because when I was 15, I was told three words that changed my life forever. It's where you have cancer. I was diagnosed with stage two bone cancer, other known as osteosarcoma, and I was given a 60% chance I was gonna die when all I wanted to do was live. I didn't want to have to deal with chemo or the appointments or my parents' devastation, I just, Want a normal life. Yet here I am with 17 sessions of chemo, which is going to last me nine months. And two months into chemo, they tell me it's not even working. I showed up for a bad haircut, and chemo's not affecting my tumor at all. It's not shrinking, it's not moving it, nothing's happening. So now I'm given a choice between a knee replacement and amputation. I immediately go to my parents and ask them what to do because I, I don't know what I should do in this situation. I, Asked my dad, and he sits me down, and he says something that I'll never forget. This is your life. I can't make this decision for you. Yes, you are 15, but you need to make this decision. And imagine being 15 years old and going to your parents, the two people that I've had the answers to your questions, and they can answer this one. Or imagine being a parent and telling your child that they need to make a choice that will determine their future forever. All my parents could do was introduce me to people that had each of these things, and I didn't make the choice from there. So I met people with a knee replacement, with an amputation, and everyone that I met with a new replacement couldn't live the life that I wanted. I wanted to run and to bike and to swim and to have a normal life. And then I finally met an amputee. And she could run, she could bike, she could swim. She's 13 years old, a lot younger than I am. And I see her stump, her prosthetic, and she's different. I immediately judged her for her disability because that's what scared me the most. I didn't want to be seen as less of a man or I didn't want to be seen as different in every single room I walk into. I didn't want to lose my leg. So now I'm stuck between these crossroads of this major decision in my life. I don't know what to do. So I flip a coin. <laughs> I decide to leave it up to this special coin that was given to me when I was first diagnosed, which says, go confidently in the directions of your dreams and live the life you have imagined. I put one side of knee replacement, one side of amputation. I tell myself, whatever this coin lands on, I'm going to do no matter what. The coin's in the air, it's flipping in slow motion, and it lands on knee replacement. Because I realized, by the time it was in the air, I knew exactly what I wanted it to land on, which was amputation. So on December 1st, 2016, I lost my leg. I still can't find it. <laughs> I don't know where it is. <laughs> and I remember waking up from the surgery, and my surgeon tells me, we had to cut more of your leg off. I look down, and it doesn't change anything. My leg's still gone. But he tells me the reason why is because if you chose knee replacement, we would have never seen this tumor that was spreading higher up your legs. We had to cut more of your leg off. So thank God you chose what you did. It's, it's one hell of a coin flip. Looking back, I never wanted cancer in my life. I never wanted my life to change. But I realized that you have to embrace the adversities and the change that's going to happen because in a world where everything was being taken away from me, I just wanted something I could control. I couldn't control chemo. I couldn't control cancer. I couldn't control 
all these different things that was happening, but the one thing that I could control was my mindset. A world of darkness, I could look for that slimmer of light that was there and choose to look at that every day rather than the bad. I could wake up with a smile, even though chemo sucked. I could choose to be positive in a negative situation. And as time goes on, I, I'm taking my first steps again. I'm getting comfortable with my disability. I'm learning to accept who I am because my leg's not growing back. I have to be confident with my disability. I'm going to brace it any time that I can. I'm going to show it off to show others that I'm comfortable in my own skin, and hopefully they see me for me, and they won't judge me in the same way that I judged her when I met her. Time goes on, and in May of 2017, I'm finishing chemo, and I finally beat cancer. But here's the thing with cancer, is that you don't beat it until you hit five years of remission. So for five years, you get to roll your dice with fate. Every three months, you get CAT scan, bone scan, brain scan, MRI, and you always get a phone call saying that you're cancer-free. You're not deemed cancer-free until you get that golden ticket saying you're officially, officially free. Eight months go by. I get scans. I get called in for surgery because they find four dots in my lungs. And dots are never a good sign because dots can mean cancer. Dots can mean I'm going to die. So we do surgery. Find four dots, number one. Scar tissue, number two, old cancer cells, number three, lymph nodes, number four. Where's number four? That's what I asked my surgeon when I wake up. They couldn't find it. Extended the surgery, couldn't find that one single dot. So now I have this random dot at the back of my mind or at the bottom of my lungs, and I have no idea where it is. Am I going to live in fear for the rest of my life? Am I going to have to constantly look over my shoulder and maybe cancer comes back, maybe it doesn't? I can't control that. But the one thing I can control is the now. I can focus to look at the good of the situation and move on with my life. So six months go by, I'm graduating high school, making it to a point in my life that I never even thought I'd reach because I was supposed to die at 15. I get my scans a week before graduating high school and we're celebrating with my class, my friends, my family, and I'm making it to this point that I never even thought I'd see. But I get back from celebrating, I get my phone call. And all I remember hearing is that you need to come in tomorrow. I already knew. I already knew it was bad. They never told me that. Everything ended with that phone call. My hopes, my dreams, my ambitions for the future, the life that I wanted, ended with that phone call. I get brought into this room full of doctors, and they tell me those damn three words I never wanted to hear again in my life. You have cancer. And there's a question that I feel like we've all sort of asked ourselves is, would you rather know how or when you're going to die? Would you spend months, years, even days preparing for this moment or avoiding that day and trying to avoid the inevitable? But for me, I couldn't maneuver myself around death because there's only so many things you can control this life and cancer isn't one of them. I'm diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. I have three months left to live and 10% chance. I'm not going to see the end of the year. I'm not going to see my 18th birthday. I'm not going to do everything that I've wanted to do because I'm passing away. Treatment is limited. There's only two forms of treatment I could do. Chemo didn't even work the first time, which is why I had to amputate. So there's a clinical trial in California, and there's a clinical trial in New York. There's no guarantee it's going to work, and there's no guarantee I'm even going to be accepted. California will only accept me if I keep this tumor inside of me. New York will only accept me if I take this tumor out of me. And the cherry on top on all this is that if I want to do surgery, I need to decide right then and there because my surgeon is going to be unavailable for three weeks. Clear under the decision, I'm not going to flip a coin. <laughs> Doing surgery the next day. I do surgery, take the tumor out of me, but I haven't got accepted into treatment. I'm still dying. I know the answer to both of those questions. I'm going to die at 17 years old to cancer in September. So what do you do with the finite amount of time you have left? This is my guide as a professional dying person. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I made a cancer bucket list. It was a list of things that I knew I was never going to be able to do, but at least I could imagine myself there. Think about what would be on your list. It didn't matter if it was small or big, or maybe you want to do something for the first time or revisit a memory of someone. But everything you put on this list, you're not going to be able to do because you're going to die by the end of the year. What would be on the list for you? 
For me, I was actually able to cross some things off my bucket list pretty recently. I was hammocking in Lake Tahoe or going to the aquarium or even going, visiting Oregon for the first time. And two months go by him. Anger, a fear, of regret of the unknown of what's going to happen if I'm going to see what's next. My friends and classmates are getting phone calls or letters to determine themselves for their future while I'm waiting to see if I'm even going to have one. Just waiting for a call that's going to determine my life. So everyone that's calling me, my family, my friends, I'm hanging up the phone. I don't care who you are. If you're not New York, bro, get out of here. I finally get a phone call from New York saying I'd accept it into immunotherapy treatment. I'd go there for six months, and I'd go there for a week and a half and come back every three weeks for immunotherapy. And on January 11th, 2019, I finished my treatment. As of last month, I can finally say three words that have changed my life forever. I'm cancer-free. I finally got my golden ticket. I could finally put cancer behind me. I never wanted cancer in my life. For the past eight years, I essentially grew up in the hospital and in and out of appointments and learning to accept my disability and dealing with cancer itself. So the one thing that I wanted to do, and I promised myself, was make videos for the person that I didn't have. When I was 15, there wasn't anyone out there that had one leg that had cancer that understood what I was going through. So I wanted to create videos for him and to shine a light upon something that no one did back then, never realizing it was going to reach millions more. I now had a voice in the disability community. You can talk about cancer in ways I never thought I could. And I wanted to advocate for an issue that me as an amputee and someone that's disabled has to deal with now. Because for many of you in this room, to go on a run, it would cost you maybe $100 in running shoes. For someone like me, for a running blade, it would cost you $35,000 out of pocket. I don't know who has the money for that. And the reason why is because insurance companies sees running as a want and not a need. So if I want to go on a run, I've got to spend 35 grand. It literally cost you a leg. I already cut mine off. I can't. What am I supposed to do there? So I wanted to advocate for this issue. I wanted to attempt something that people have always told me was never going to be possible, running a marathon. Now, the normal time to train for a marathon is about 16 to 20 weeks, maybe even months, years, to prepare for 26 miles. And one month before the San Francisco Marathon, the seventh hardest marathon in the world, I decided I wanted to try in order to advocate for how much we have to spend. Except I wanted to do it on crutches because that's how much I'd have to spend if I didn't have one. So uh, I trained for five days. I'd say that's a pretty solid amount. <laughs> have five miles under my belt. It's going to go great, right? <laughs> but I've had worse odds. Very low chance I'm going to see that finish line, but. After nine hours, I completed 16 miles on crutches, and we were able to raise about $10,000 for prosthetics. I can never let having one leg or cancer stop me from doing things that I want to do in this life. I can never let having one leg or having a disability limit me from the things that I want to even try. Cancer has taught me so much, and I'm glad that I got cancer, and I know if my 15-year-old self heard me say that, he'd come up here and slap me right now the lessons that it has taught me and the appreciation of life, because your life can change in an instant, a mere three words can change your life forever. So the one thing that I want to leave you with is this, because the moment I started dying, it's when I finally started to focus on living. So why not do that now? Thank you.